Triple R Ministries. My name is Richard Ross and I am a servant of the Most High God. Today we are going through Matthew chapter 17 in its entirety. I will open up by reading the text of Matthew 17 in its entirety. I'll be reading out of a New King James Version Bible. Okay, after reading the text, I'll pause for a quick moment of prayer. Then we will go into interpreting the scripture. Uh, please let me say this. Uh, please do not allow Bible literacy videos, sermons, and the like to uh, to uh, stop you from attending a physical church location. It is very important that we gather together in fellowship, um, uh, you know, face to face uh, with other believers, encouraging each other as we see the day approaching. Uh, that scripture that we do not stop attending church though uh, vi online Bible videos and that can be very helpful and you know uh, deepening your understanding is I still encourage you to attend a physical church okay let's go into reading the scripture um, Matthew chapter 17 verse number one now after six days Jesus took Peter James and John his brother led them up on a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell to their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Arise, do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Uh, and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except for praying and fasting. Now while, there was, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be portrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. And when they had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom 
do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. Okay, that's uh, Matthew 17 it's in its entirety. And pause for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, I honor you. I glorify your name, lifting you over all things. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Nothing would be without you. All power is in your hands. I ask you again, Father, to please wash me clean with the blood of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. I pray, ask, and beg of you to please give me a reasonable portion of your Holy Spirit, Father, so that I may accurately interpret and express your word to your flock. I pray and ask that your will be done over all things. I pray and ask all these things in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right, let's do a bit of geography here. So Matthew 17 opens up um, their current location when, at Matthew 17 verse 1 is most likely in Caesarea Philippi, okay? Back in Matthew chapter 16 verse number 13, that's the last listed location where they were uh, at. So I assume here in Matthew 17 verse 1 that they are still in Caesarea Philippi. Okay, then once we get to Matthew chapter 17, verse 22, they move to the region of Galilee. Uh, that's kind of a vague uh, description here of uh, uh, where they were because Galilee is such a large area. There's like upper Galilee and there's lower Galilee. But Galilee is essentially um, uh, west of the Sea of Galilee. Okay. The west side of the Sea of Galilee, all of that is Galilee, okay? Uh, the northern part is uh, Upper Galilee. The southern part is Lower Galilee, okay? And then from there, uh, they went to uh, Capernaum, which is in Matthew 17, verse number 24. Capernaum is uh, directly above the Sea of Galilee, slightly west, okay? All right, and that's uh, the geography for today's um, reading. And I always say a great point of reference when trying to determine where something is in the biblical text, a great point of reference to be able to accurately locate is the Sea of Galilee. If you can accurately locate the Sea of Galilee at all times, you know, on any given map, then you can... Uh, easily determine where everything else is happening from there. You can find your direction from there. All right. Sea of Galilee is a great point of reference. All right. So let's move forward here into interpreting the scriptures. So check this out. Matthew 17 opens up with Jesus taking Peter, James, and John upon a mountain and being transformed right there in front of their face. Now, we're going to go to, uh, um, we're going to go to Luke, okay? And we're going to read this account of Jesus being transfigured in Luke because there's a, a bit more detail that's not mentioned in Matthew 17. So, I'm going to go ahead to Luke 9, 28 through 36, okay? Luke 9, 28 through 36. All right. Okay, and I'll just read here. Starting at verse number 28. Now it came to pass about eight days after these things that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, uh, let me pause right here. In Matthew 17, it didn't say that he went up the mountain to pray. It just said that they went up the mountain. All right, so here we know that they went up to mount, the mountain to pray. All right, verse 29. As he prayed, the appearance of his face were, was altered, 
and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So, what was the purpose of Jesus going up on the mount with, uh, with Peter, John, and James? Okay, The purpose of P Jesus going up this mount uh, to be transfigured was so that he might um, uh, speak with Elijah and uh, and uh, uh, what's his name and Moses about his decease. What do you mean his decease? Jesus was going. Jesus had his was set to go to Jerusalem to be killed by the by the elders, the chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees. This was the purpose of Jesus' entire life was to come and pay the ransom for the sins of the entire world, okay? And Jesus was about to head in that direction. So um, 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 he went up on this mount to, to speak with Moses and Elijah about his departure, about him dying, okay? That's what they was chopping it up about, all right? That's the purpose of that uh, this journey here, okay? Uh, verse number 32. But Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory in the two men who stood with him. Then it happened, as they were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was still saying this, a cloud overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things that they had seen. Okay? So when, when God spoke to them from the bright cloud, Essentially, God was correcting Peter for saying, Hey, let me make an altar for one for you, one for Moses, and one for uh, Elijah. And then God's like, Hold on now. Don't be putting my son on this uh, same scale as these men. This is my son. There's a difference between who Christ is and who Moses and Elijah is. This is my son. Hear him. Type of thing. So God was like correcting them. Cool. All right. Okay. So let's move forward here. All right. So Jesus' disciple, uh, 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 what's his name? His disciples asked him like, okay, so why do the scribes in the, uh, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And we just seen you talking here with Elijah like, like what's going on, like type of deal, because they were quoting uh, they were quoting uh, Malachi, the book of Malachi, chapter four, verse number five. That's what the scribes were teaching them that Elijah must come first before the Messiah. Okay, all right. So, and Jesus tells them, okay. Um, Elijah is coming first, and he already came, and he came in John the Baptist, essentially is what, what Christ said. John the Baptist was the second coming of Elijah type of deal, all right? So let's pause and think about this for a second. First time I really uh, put some thought into this, I said, oh, snap. They're talking about reincarnation. Elijah lived before, okay? He lived back in the uh, Old Testament in that. And here he is, reincarnated into John the Baptist type of deal. And there might be some kind of a, you know, some truth to that. I don't know if I believe in reincarnation like, you know, how most people believe in it. You know, I wouldn't say most people, but, but as the definition of reincarnation is. But I think of it as more more of a spiritual aspect uh, 
reincarnation is more like a, a spiritual thing and it's not like okay you know I die and then I'm gonna come back in somebody else's body and that's gonna be that you know that's gonna be me again living in them their entire life now this is not exactly how it is it's a spiritual thing meaning that 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 okay let's take uh, John the Baptist and Elijah for example John the Baptist um, um, was in the likeness of Elijah. Uh, uh, John the Baptist spiritually was Elijah. Okay, okay, type of deal. All right. You know, if if you can't follow me, let me uh, do some examples here. Okay. All right. All right. So back in the Old Testament, there was somebody called Jezebel who would she was. Uh, uh, against God and she used to persecute the prophets of God type of deal okay um, okay now now Jezebel died okay God how had her suffer a, uh, a horrible death she was thrown off of a, a tall building and splattered on the ground and was trampled by horses and ate by dogs that's how she died okay now here today there are people on the earth that um, that are acting within the spirit of Jezebel type of thing. They're not Jezebel reincarnate, but they their spirit is in the likeness of Jezebel. Let me say this too. That wasn't the original spirit. The, how Jezebel was acting, that wasn't her original spirit. She didn't create that thing. She was under demonic influence, okay, type of deal. So she was of the spirit of some other demonic thing and it just got labeled the spirit of Jezebel all right and that's still going on here today people who are uh, they're they're anti god they're anti uh you know preachers ministers type of thing it's the same spirit uh that Jezebel was under the influence of okay and the spirit of Jezebel is mentioned again in Revelation chapter 2 verse number 20 go there Revelation 2.20 reads Nevertheless, I have a... Now this is Jesus uh, talking about a corrupt church in the book of Revelation, chapter number 2. Okay? And uh, he says, Nevertheless, I have found a a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality or sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols Jezebel obviously was long dead back in the book of Kings okay um, so she's obviously not still alive in Revelation 220 which is future tense okay now now, this is the spirit and the likeness of Jezebel that, that, that he's referring to here. All right, let's do another example. Uh, the spirit of the Antichrist, okay? All right? So, the anti Antichrist was, were already ar uh, around in the time um, that Christ lived. And even before he was lived, before he lived, you know what I'm saying? Satan didn't want Christ to come into the world and... And, and complete the purpose that God had for him, which was to redeem mankind to himself, okay? Okay, so, so uh, uh, the spirit of Satan, if you will, is the original spirit of the Antichrist type of thing, all right? All right, um, the, 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 uh, the, the king, King Herod, okay, who killed all of the boys, baby boys, two years old and under, trying to kill Christ, he was influenced by the spirit of the Antichrist, okay? And when Christ walked on this earth, okay, when he was uh, one of the, the Pharisees and Sadducees that persecuted him and had him over to be crucified were under the spirit of the Antichrist. They were Antichrist, wasn't they? Yeah, okay, all right. All right, let's check this out. Let's go to uh, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. All right, First John, chapter four, verses two through three. 
By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. This, 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 this Antichrist is the spirit of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist will uh, take flesh, okay? There will be a person fully possessed by the spirit of the Antichrist who will be the Antichrist. Um, until that, you know, uh, uh, thing happens and comes to pass and that the spirit of the Antichrist is still uh, within the world, all right? So, 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 so Elijah, okay, the spirit of Elijah, similar to the, not to, you know, put him on his bad, on the scale with all these bad spirits, but, you know, okay, so the spirit of Elijah was manifested in uh, John the Baptist, okay, and that's what the, that's, that's what this whole thing is about, about Elijah coming first. Elijah did come first in John the Baptist, okay, and that's what that was all about, all right. Okay, and I'll do one life example. This is not biblical. I have a, a, a my grandfather, Claudius Parker, Sr., okay? He is uh, now deceased, okay? He's been deceased for some years now. Uh, I know it was before 2005. I want to say maybe 03 he, uh, he passed, okay? So, my grandfather is Claudius Parker Sr., all right? Um, he has a son, which is my uncle, Claudius Parker uh, Jr., okay? All right? And underneath Claudius Parker Jr., he had a son, okay? And his son was born after Claudius Parker Sr. died, okay? So the son is, the, the grandson, if you will, is Claudius Parker III, all right? And my uncle made a, uh, a statement to me that I'll never forget. And he, was, he explained to me that his son, Claudius Parker III, was so much in the likeness of Claudius Parker Sr. that, that he felt uh, it's a possibility that my grandfather has been reincarnated into uh, his grandson type of deal. Now, I, I would say uh, this, you know, in relation to talking about Elijah being, uh, or John the Baptist being of the spirit of Elijah, I say that uh, my cousin, which is Claudius Parker III, uh, is in the same spiritual likeness of Claudius Parker Sr., okay? But this same spirit in the likeness of Claudius Parker Sr. is displayed in the son, Claudius Parker Jr., and also displayed in the grandson, Claudius Parker III, type of deal. Alright, so it is very possible and uh, likely that, you know, uh, 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 we can be, that, that our spirit can live on. Uh, we can be influenced, you know, throughout our, uh, our, our, we can have our spiritual influence to go throughout our offspring. Alright, I'm not the best, I'm not the most spiritual person, okay, alright, but I would hope that some good part of me would rub off into the uh, generations that my, my offspring that, that is in the world. I would hope that, you know, God-fearing, Christ-accepting behaviors would trickle down throughout my uh, genealogy, if you will, um, type of thing. All right. Oh, okay. Let's move forward. All right. Boy is Hill. So, this account is also mentioned in uh, in Luke. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll tell you the differences. In Matthew. Okay. So here is this 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 father. Uh, uh, brings his child to Christ, and he's like, look, my child is suffering from epilepsy. He oftentimes 
falls over into the fire. Sometimes he falls over into the water like he's all messed up, like Jesus here. I tried to get your disciples to heal him, but they couldn't heal him. What's going on with that, Jesus? Uh, can you heal him? So Jesus is like, yeah, bring him to me, and he healed him, right? All right, cool. So in the book of Luke, this father brings the child to Christ, right? And he's like, and he is describing, he's like, Christ, my child is oftentimes seized by a spirit. He didn't say he had epilepsy. He said, my child's oftentimes seized by a spirit. And he cries out and convulses him. Everybody's seeing like the uh, exorcist, right? And the, the, the little girl's all convulsed and doing all these crazy movements, right? And convulses him and he foams at the mouth. And the spirit bruises him and comes out with great difficulty. That's how the father descri described his son's condition to Christ. And then in Luke, when the, fa the father was bringing his son to Christ, the, he, the son fell down on the ground and started convulsing and doing all this stuff. You know what I'm saying? And uh, before Christ went ahead and healed him. Okay, so Jesus, Jesus healed him, cast out the spirit, healed the boy, returned the boy to his father. And the disciples come to Christ and they like, Lord, why couldn't we get rid of this unclean spirit? And Christ tells them, it's because of your unbelief. This part isn't in Luke, all right? This is, uh, I want to say this is exclusive to Matthew. Uh, Christ says, it's because of your unbelief that you couldn't uh, cast this unclean spirit out, all right? He says, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell a mountain to move from here to there, and it will do it, all right? And he goes on, and he says, like, nothing will be impossible if you have the faith. And he's like, this kind of spirit only comes out through praying and fasting. All right, check this out. What does praying and fasting have to do with removing an unclean spirit from a person? All right. What does praying and fasting have to do with exercising a demon out of a person? All right. All right. Okay. Okay. So the first question I asked myself long ago was, who has to pray and fast? Is it the person that's trying to cast the demon out? Or is it the person who was possessed by a demon? Which person has to pray and fast here? All right. Uh, a great answer would be both. Oh, my goodness. If you got the, the, the person trying to cast the demon out and the person possessed, both praying and fasting, that would be awesome. I'm, I'm pretty sure that demon would be out of there. All right. All right. But I think this emphasis is on the person that is trying to cast the demon out of the unclean person. The person that's trying to class, cast the demon out should pray and fast. So again, I ask the question, what does praying and fasting have to do with casting a demon out of a person? All right, Jesus told them that they couldn't do it, they couldn't cast the demon out because of their unbelief. So, when a person prays, and a person fasts, what is fasting anyway? Fasting is refraining from, from, from something that you usually partake in. Uh, most of the time it's food, okay? The human body needs food in order to survive, okay? It needs it. If you don't eat food, you will die, okay? So, what happens when a person denies themselves of something that they need such as food it it minimizes the influence that the body the, the the power that the body has and it it allows the body to then yield to what the mind tells the body to do okay all right all right all right but in order for the body to yield to the mind first the mind has to yield to our spirit okay so we're saying hey I want to be closer to God. I want to not live in the flesh. Uh, the fruit of the flesh can be found in Galatians chapter 5, as well as the fruit of the Spirit can be found in Galatians chapter 5. Fruit of the flesh, you know, uh, lying, cheating, stealing, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, drunkenness, things of this nature. Fruit of the Spirit, love, patience, joy, kindness, long-suffering, etc., and so forth and so on. So, if I don't want to live according to my flesh and I want to live more according to my spirit and I want to I want to strengthen the spirit so that my spirit can 
can, can, so that my mind can yield to my spirit and so that my body can yield to my mind, I will pray and I will fast because I'm denying my body its power. I'm denying my body because my body feels like, oh, I got to do what I got to do and there's nothing that can be done about it. My mind says, nobody, you have to listen to me. You don't even have to eat if I tell you not to eat, right? And the mind is like, oh man, but I want to eat. But my spirit is like, no, control yourself. Just refrain this body from eating so I can be stronger with the Lord. And at the end of the day, we'll all be better off. Our body will be going in a different direction because our mind is telling it to go into a different direction because our mind is listening to what our spirit is telling it to do. All right? When our spirit is strengthened in the Lord type of deal, okay? All right? All right, cool. Because if our spirit, if we're not operating according to the Lord, which is which which God gives us the Holy Spirit of Himself, capital S on the Spirit, okay? The where our body is a temple for the Holy Spirit of God to live in us. All right, that's how we're supposed to function. That's where we're supposed to get our direction from. But if we're not living according to the Holy Spirit of God. We are influenced by unclean spirits, lowercase s, that will have our mind and our body in places where we don't want it to be type of deal. Sure, it may be some physical pleasure. Sure, it may be temporary short-term satisfaction. But the long-term outcome is destruction and hellfire. We don't want to go that path. We want to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God and have our mind and our body going in that direction. What Christ say, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. That's what happens when we yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, uh, but Satan has come to kill, to steal, and destroy. Okay, that's all he's come to do. And that's what happens when we're influenced by unclean spirit. So, to pray and to fast is to connect ourselves and hold strongly on to the Holy Spirit of God. To make ourselves uh, more available to uh, a better residence for the Holy Spirit of God, if you will. And in doing so, we increase our faith. We, we increase our belief in God because we're more dependent on God. We're saying, God, I need you more than I need this food. I need you more than I need whatever it is that I'm denying myself from, Father. Uh, 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 I'm trusting in you, Lord. Increase my, increase my whatever your weakness is. The Lord will increase our faith type of deal. Okay, okay, okay. And, and Christ says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, which is a teeny, teeny small seed. Christ said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can tell an entire mountain. You can tell an entire problem that you just don't know how to get through. You can tell that problem to move aside because you're going through it type of thing. And it'll happen. If you just have that much faith, so 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 if you wanna Christ is like if you wanna cast out this unclean spirit, you got to pray and fast to increase your faith so you can minimize your unbelief, so you can tell that spirit, get up out of here and it's gonna listen, type of deal. Okay? Alright, cool. Alright. Side note, uh I'm going to put in a reference verse here. For Matthew chapter 12, verse numbers 43 through 45, okay? Because Jesus describes what happens when an unclean spirit leaves up out of a person but comes back into a person. All right, check this out. This truth that is directly talking about what we're talking about. we talking about casting out an unclean spirit and praying and fasting so that we can have enough faith and belief to do so, right? All right, so let's say it happens. We cast that unclean spirit out, all right? We go about our business, and let's say that unclean spirit returns. Check this out. Matthew 12, verse 43. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter that man and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So it shall be with this wicked generation. 
So, summarizing, Christ says when an unclean spirit comes out of a person, and that person is healed, and they clean themselves up, and they get their act together, right? And the unclean spirit that came out of them tries to find somewhere else to go, but can't find anywhere to go, so he returns to the person that it had just previously, previously possessed. And when it comes back to that person, it's like, oh man, they didn't got their stuff together. Okay, cool. And they go and get all of their wicked, evil spirit friends, and they come in and possess that person even worse. And that person be tore up from the floor, even worse than they was from before. So I said, wow, ain't that something? Because that must mean we got to be cautious about casting out unclean spirits then, because I don't want a person to be worse off than they, than they started. You know what I'm saying? So I come to one of two conclusions, okay? Okay? I come to one of two conclusions. The first conclusion, which, man, as time goes on and I'm getting deeper in my learning and understanding, I'm, I'm holding more on to the first conclusion. Now, this is, this is all Richard Ross here. This isn't exactly biblical. This is my uh, opinion type of deal, all right? The first conclusion I could come to is... All right, that we should master our demons through obedience to Christ. All right, all right, all right. For let me use myself for an example. Okay, uh, I have a weakness that I probably shouldn't tell the whole world, but I'm going to tell the world anyway, just because this is something that's common to man or even a uh, woman. My weakness is to have sexual desires for the opposite sex. I love women type of deal, okay? All right, now check this out. Check this out. Once I got saved and began to still walk with the Lord and read and study and pray and, and witness and uh, uh, fellowship with other believers and that, I still love women. You know what I'm saying? So, but 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 there's there, there's 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 something that's happening here because uh, my spirit tells my mind, hey, you can't have every woman you want type of deal. My mind tells my body, hey, word on the street is we can't have every woman on, we, we, we want. So we got to be cool type of deal. So slowly but surely, the more I make it a habit, the, 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 the more it actually becomes a habit, okay? But I'm still uh, subject to that. I don't want to be isolating myself with all types of manners of women, lest I fall into that temptation type of deal. So, 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 so what I'm trying to say is, perhaps through obedience to Christ, I should be mastering this uncleanness that is within me versus trying to completely expel it, okay? Let's say I pray, I got exorcisms and all of this stuff to remove the desire from me that I have for women in that, okay? Let's say it's removed from me. You know, and I go about my business and this uncleanness that was removed from me comes back and, and, and brings friends with me. All right. And I'm even worse than I was at first. Man, wouldn't it have been better that I just mastered that, controlled that thing, kept that thing tucked in the box? You know what I'm saying? If I just stayed in my lane type of deal, would I, wouldn't I have been better off than to be possessed by all kind of weird perverted type of stuff? You know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. So that's one thing I take out of this teaching that Christ gives us in 12 about an unclean spirit returning. Okay. A second conclusion I could come to that's kind of the same, a little different is uh, uh, to fill the void that the unclean spirit used to, that what they used to reside in us. If we were to be, uh, have this uncleanness cast out of us, if we would fill that void with Christ, okay, type of deal. And that's, that's great. That sounds beautiful. That sounds amazing. But through personal experience, that sounds a little, it doesn't sound like realistic to me, okay? Because I know that I'm still subject to these things. So I think the best we should do is try to uh, try, try our best to, uh, to, 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 to master our demons. Put them in a, a jail cell, lock them away, do not let them have their way uh, in our lives. Through obedience to Christ. How are you obedient to Christ? First, you got to know what Christ said. Okay? After you know what he said, guess what? Then you got to do it. 
that's obedience to Christ, okay? And I think in doing that, you know what I'm saying, them about don't stand a chance. They about don't even want to be here no more. They about get up out of there on their own type of deal, you know? Wish mine's to get out. All right, let's move forward here. Okay, we're going back to Matthew. All right. Okay, Matthew 17. We're towards the end here, so I'll be closing here soon. All right. So going on from there, while while they're in Galilee, Jesus explains to his disciples that he has to uh, go towards Jerusalem. He doesn't he doesn't say Jerusalem. He says the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. And his, his, his disciples were exceedingly sorrowful when they heard this. All right. Okay. I know in the book of John here, <clears throat> I'm not going to go there right now. But in the book of John, Jesus talks about, he, he, he gives, he talks about the peace that he leaves us. For, I'm going to John. Forget it. I'm going to John. This wasn't part of the plan. All right. Jesus talks about the peace that he leaves us because he's, because he's going to the Father, okay? Because his, his disciples were exceedingly sorrowful about him leaving, about him having to, having to be uh, delivered to the, to the religious leaders and be persecuted and even killed. His disciples are like, oh, Lord, why? Type of deal. All right. So Jesus gives them comfort. All right. And the comfort that Jesus gives them, check this out. Matthew chapter 14. I'm just going to start at verse number 19, okay? Jesus says, a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. And at that day, at that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments is he, he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. All right. Then Judas say, uh, not Iscrit, or the other Judas says, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and my word which you hear is not mine, but my father's who sent me. This this ties into uh, 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 being obedient to the word of Christ. Now, okay, Christ's disciples were sorrowful because Christ told him he had to be delivered and, and you know killed by the uh, elder scribes and Pharisees and that, all right? And they were exceedingly sorrowful, right? So Christ says this to comfort them. These things I, I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. And Jesus says this, look, he says, to, 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 to help them with their sorrow, he says, peace I leave with you, and my peace I give you, not as the world gives you. Let not your heart be troubled nor afraid. Look, Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. So the world gives you stuff, right? And then... The world take it back. The world gives you something under some kind of condition. They say, okay, you can have this if you X, Y, Z, yada, yada, yada. Under these circumstances, you can have this. Christ says, look, my peace I give you. Not as the world give you. I'm giving you my peace unconditionally. Okay, are you a disciple of Christ? Do you believe Jesus died, buried, that died, was buried, and rose again, and that you're covered in his blood, making atonement for your sins? Okay, if you believe that, then you have the peace of Christ. Christ gave you his peace. 
So, so, and he didn't give it to you under some circumstantial situational thing. He gives it to you like, here, it's there. So all you have to do is essentially reach out and hold on to it regardless of your situation, your circumstance, the adversity that this life brings you, any kind of persecution that you may be under, any kind of discomfort, whatever. You still have the peace that Christ left you. Oh, that's so powerful. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let your heart not be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. And if you love me, you will rejoice because I said, I am going to my father. For my father is greater than I. Alright. Now I've told you before it comes. That when it does come to pass, you might believe. I no longer talk to you, talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming and has nothing in me. But, but that the world may know that I love the Father, as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Alright, alright. Let's go back to Matthew 17. That was kind of flying off the hook there. It wasn't part of the game plan. Alright. There's a song. Um, I forget the dude that made the, the name of the dude that made it, my peace I give to you. Alright? They sung that song in church, had me crying like a little baby. They had me crying like a schoolgirl. Alright? Because I appreciate the, the peace that Christ gave to me. It's called the promise. Alright? It's called the promise. What's the dude name that made that song? I don't remember. Alright, going forward. Uh, all right, we're, we're at the end of Matthew 17. I'm closing for real, for real. All right, talking about the uh, taxes and that. So when they came to Capernaum, one of the tax collectors came to Peter like, so what's up, do your, do your master pay taxes or not? Peter like, yeah, he pay taxes. So then when he went in the house, Jesus knew what he was thinking, came to him like, Jesus came to him like, what you think? Uh, uh, what do you say here? What you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? And Simon like from strangers. And Jesus like then the sons are free, but lest we offend them, you know, go cast, go fishing, catch the fish, take coin out of his mouth, and pay the taxes for both of us. So Jesus is the Son of God. Alright, check this out. In this time period, the scribes and the Pharisees didn't have to pay taxes, type of deal. So if they don't gotta pay taxes, Jesus most uh jesus is way more like his the hierarchy of power importance he's way over described the he's the son of god okay so if they don't gotta pay taxes he don't gotta pay taxes but jesus is like look unless they get mad so they don't get mad at us and you know cause all this uproar just here go fishing take coin out and pay the taxes for our behalf but christ was you know exempt from the type of deal all right that concludes matthew 17 in this entirety, I hope it's been a blessing for you. Uh, my Peace I Give to You by Ricky, Ricky Diller. That's the name of it. All right. Check it out. It's a beautiful song. All right. God bless you all. Take care.